to order the Raymore Charter Review Commission meeting for March 21, 2017, and I'd ask for a confirmation of quorum. Commissioners Wilson? Present. Acklin? Present. Burke? Present. Castleman? Present. Wiggins? Present. Hubach? Present. Stidham? Present. Daring? Present. Moorhead? Present. Please, <coughs> pardon me, please stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I didn't stand because it was too hard to get back up there, but I, <laughs> I don't mean show. any disrespect. I know well, during city council. Uh, Colin Kaepernick would appreciate your gesture. Okay. <laughs> How, <wow>. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I We have included our packet, our minutes from March 7th. I'll entertain a motion to approve. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Passes, una uh, passes unanimously with, Sustain. with an abstention. Okay. Yes. So he was absent last week. Yes. Yeah. Eight, eight in favor with one abstention. All right. Moving on to we have <coughs> unfinished business. The unfinished business is technically under our new business, so we'll jump directly to that. We have set forward to tonight's meeting all of Article 7 for the sole right. purpose of having a staff report from Mr. Zur um, in light of the state's actions and the council's subsequent actions and the intent to make adjustment to the code. We want to make sure that we didn't spend unnecessary time that we get kind of harmonized as quick as possible. At that point, I'll turn it over to Mr. Zur. Thank you, Chairman. It's a pleasure to be able to be before the Commission again. Uh, I have gone through all of Article 7 and have correlated with it uh, provisions from Chapter 479 of the Revised Statutes of Missouri, which cover municipal courts and traffic courts. I've also correlated the same provisions with provisions from the uh, Chapter 130 of our current code uh, for the City of Raymore, and that current code language uh, includes a whole lot of the same information that we will see under the terms of the Charter, uh, where what I have done is I basically will be able to identify for each of you this evening uh, what provisions in the code match with provisions from the charter and similarly what provisions from chapter 479 are required for the charter as well. Am I doing okay? Can you hear me? Okay, good. Uh, I've also, there is many of the sections we will talk about have specific references to uh, the code as well as the, the revised statutes of Missouri. The last section, section 7.3, and I'm going to not jump ahead at this point, but uh, there are provisions with Rule 37 as adopted by the Missouri Supreme Court, as well as provisions uh, adopted for best practices recommendations uh, for Missouri municipal courts that will come into play. What I would tell you is you will find that much of 7.1 and 7.2 are going to be covered by chapters within or by provisions within the code as well as the revised statutes. Section 7.3 has room for what I would consider good discussion by this commission this evening, though I will caution substantial changes based upon Rule 37. We can talk about those when we come to it. Um, my thought for you is, if you're okay with it, I will start at Section 7.1 and give you the provisions from code and um, statutory provisions that relate to that particular section. We can ask any questions that you've got and answer any of those questions for you that I'm able to do so, okay? If you're looking at section 7.1, there shall be a municipal court which shall have jurisdiction to hear and determine all cases involving alleged violations of ordinances of the city and to assess punishment by fine or incarceration as therein provided. This court is a continuation of the municipal court of the city as previously established under the 17th Judicial Circuit Court of the State of Missouri. Municipal Court shall be subject to the rules of the Missouri Supreme Court and the Circuit Court, which it is a part. If you were to pull out section 130.010 and 130.020 of our, uniform, of our uh, Code of Ordinances, you will see almost verbatim that same language incorporated there. So I would be hesitant to make substantial changes. We can talk about proposed changes if you'd like. Uh, if there are changes that are truly identified, we as staff will need to make sure that they get correlated over to the code of ordinances as well. So, section 7.1, uh, by
by and large is encompassed within section 130, uh, 0010 and 020. It is also authorized by statutory provisions, and that is section 479.020 of the revised statutes of Missouri, which allow any city, village, or town, or those operating under a constitutional or special charter city with a population of 400,000 people or more to provide by ordinance or charter for the selection, tenure, and compensation of a municipal judge or judges with the provisions of this chapter. So uh, the authority under statutory provision for the establishment of this is section 479.020. Okay. Mr. Zer, if I could interrupt one sure. moment with a question. So when we're looking at 7.1 under jurisdiction, mm -hmm. any changes that occurred at the state level really don't change the general nature of jurisdiction of the court. We are still basically a branch of the 17th Judicial Circuit. And if we look at the last sentence in that chapter, the municipal court shall be subject to the rules of the Missouri Supreme Court and the Circuit Court. And so in essence, any of the Ferguson changes or the Senate bills or that are always been cited, yeah. that provision, that sentence actually covers any changes under that we abide by, so therefore, we don't have to make a charter change to recognize those changes. That is correct. So any changes, and, I, and Chairman, I believe what you're referring to there is Rule 37, which is the most critical changes to come out lately, and those are a result of the uh, instance in Ferguson. Uh, the Rule 37 changes have been substantial in the Missouri court system, and uh, you're exactly correct with the language that does incorporate it, and part of the Rule 37 changes to make sure that we establish separate areas. Here's the municipal court, here is our city council, here is our executive branch, and so we are uh, defining clear distinctions between each of them. So, yes, that is absolutely correct. Any other questions on 7 1 before you move on? We can still go back and discuss it. I just didn't know if you had staff questions. Okay. If not, if 7 point, any further? Uh, nothing further on section 7.1. Uh, section 7.2 discusses the judges for the municipal court. In this particular case, the judge of the municipal court shall consist of one or more municipal judges as determined from time to time by the council. Again, on this one, I would refer to section 479.020 of the revised statutes of Missouri, which provide that the council, the method of selection of municipal judges shall be provided for by charter or ordinance. Each municipal judge shall be selected for a term of not less than two years as provided for by the charter and ordinance. So um, the language there is consistent with 479. We do have provisions within our charter for how we are choosing our municipal judges. Uh, appointment and terms. Each municipal judge shall be appointed by the mayor with advice and consent of three-fourths of the entire council. This section is referenced directly from code, section 130.030, which has the same language incorporated within it for the appointment by the mayor as well as subject to approval by three quarters of the vote of the entire council. Um, the second portion of that paragraph talks about uh, municipal judge shall be appointed for a term of two years, provided, however, that nothing shall preclude a municipal judge from serving successive terms. This again is controlled by 020, I'm sorry, uh, statutory provisions. Um, and the time frame for the same, subparagraph one. So again, uh, statutory authority allows for the creation of the tenure. You want me to stop there and let you talk no, about please subparagraph A? No, no. Any questions about Let's subparagraph Let's do all seven two. And all seven. Uh, powers and duties. A municipal judge shall have such powers and duties as are conferred upon such officers by law or by ordinance. This is controlled by section 130.100 of our municipal code and section 130.110, which specifically identifies the powers and duties generally of the municipal judge. Also authorized by 479.070 of the revised statutes of Missouri. So very similar language in both of those locations. Uh, statutory provision has a specific paragraph on the duties and powers of the municipal judge, including that the municipal judge is the conservator of the peace within the city, uh, as well as the, the individual who maintains the dockets and records. 
Qualifications of the municipal judge, again, these are established by statutory provisions. The statutory provisions authorize the city by ordinance or by charter to establish what those qualifications are. In our case, we have that outlined in code section 130.040, which again is very similar to the language that you'll see there. 040 says, the person appointed municipal judge shall comply with all requirements presently set forth by city ordinances and the Missouri state statutes, except that said person appointed need not be a resident of the city of Raymore and may serve as a municipal judge in other municipalities. The municipal judge shall not have been licensed to practice law in the state of Missouri for a period of at least three years. So you can see very similar language being qualified under the qualifications provision for that. Any questions on that one? I had one question, Linda. Having to do with the terms, like when it talks about two years and three years, is that set by the, uh, the courts themselves, or is that something that we can set? That we set. Why would we want something just to be two years? If it's going to be a good judge, then wouldn't we want them to have three or four or five? I tell you what, because of the nature of this section, that's a great topic, so when we go back to discuss this, let's make sure to point that out. I wanted to let him get through his staff report on it, so the questions for staff are where we're at now. But that would be a great point to bring up when we go through this. Um, okay, moving on, the prohibition. No municipal judge shall hold any other off city office or city employment during the term for which the judge was appointed. That is going to be governed by uh, 479.0206 of the Revised Statutes of Missouri, which says no municipal judge shall hold any other office in the municipality which the municipal judge serves as judge. So that is basically pulling out statutory provision and inserting it into our charter. The next sentence you'd see is, and no former municipal judge shall hold any compensated appointive city office or city employment until one year after the expiration of the term for which the judge was appointed. This will be controlled by a different statutory provision. Uh, it's for conflicts of interest that have been established for public officers. Uh, section 105.454 of the Revised Statutes of Missouri, subparagraph 5, will control, and that indicates that uh, a public official who is elected or appointed uh, is prohibited from being able to, from, for one year from the date of his term, expiration of his term, from serving in that capacity. So that's almost a direct uh, correlation, word for word, between that section, okay? Moving on, vacancies. The municipal judge's office shall become vacant upon the judge's death, resignation, or removal from office in any manner authorized by this charter or by law or upon forfeiture of the office. This will be controlled by the statutory, I'm sorry, ordinances for Raymore including section 130.060, which has as a subparagraph A, how a judge's position becomes vacant, or how a municipal judge shall vacate his or her office, and it basically incorporates the same language um, that you'll see under the next subparagraph. Uh, so just so you know, a municipal judge shall vacate his or her office in the following circumstances upon removal from office by the State Commission on Retirement, Removal, and Discipline of Judges, which I have information on here if you all are interested, upon attaining his or her 75th birthday, or upon the judge's death, resignation, or removal from office in any manner authorized by the charter or by law, or upon forfeiture of the office. So there is specific reference in the charter and in the code for how that would take place. Under forfeiture of office, a municipal judge shall forfeit his or her office if the judge, one, at any time during the term of office lacks any qualification for the office prescribed by charter or law, violates any prohibition as provided in section 7.2, and we've covered that before, so it's all the prior language that you got there, or violates the requirements of section 14.1, which we have not yet gotten to at this particular point. We can discuss that if you're so inclined. Um, the statutory provisions, or I'm sorry, the code provisions for this are found in section 130.060B, which is a municipal judge shall forfeit his or her office if the judge at any time during the term of office lacks any qualification, 
violates any prohibition or violates the requirements of Section 14.1. So it is almost an exact duplication of uh, what you've got in the terms of the charter right now. If we make alterations to that, we as staff will need to address that also in the code provisions. Okay? And I'm almost done, I promise. Removal from office. Yes. Um, you said something about age 75. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, at age 75, are they asked to step down? Uh, they would have to. They would have a forced retirement, and that's also going to be by co uh, statute as well. So we should that be addressed in uh, yeah, the forfeiture of office. It's included in where it talks about following state code, isn't it? Uh, that would be correct, and you'd also have the reference for 7.2D. I guess not. Well, by implication, you'd have 7.2B and C, because under powers and duties, basically the age 75, the forced retirement, removes power and duties by implication. And then under qualifications, since you exceed the 75 years, you would therefore not be qualified by the state to serve as a judge, and therefore under our code, lack qualification. Section 479.0207, <coughs> no person shall serve as municipal judge after that person has reached that person's 74th birthday. So that's in the state statute as well. Then no judge, no one can serve after their 74? Seven, 75. Once they hit their 75th birthday. Yes, well, some of these judges serve longer than that. I mean, they're no longer active. But then they're called upon, because I remember when Charles Gunn was called upon, there was an emergency of some kind, the judge was not available, and he had been retired for some time, and he was called upon to act. This is limited to municipal judges. Yes. It's limited to municipal, municipal. judges. No. Yeah. Not Supreme. Right. Not Supreme. Right. But that was at the county level, right. but I'm, I'm seeing it all the same way. Well, I tell you what, when we go back on this, that will get addressed in the beginning of 7.2 because I have some comments that will answer your question there. Okay. That will help that. Subparagraph G of 7.2 talks about removal from office and does make specific reference in there as provided for by law or by the rules of Missouri Supreme Court. Um, what I would tell you is there is a provision and a method for removal of a judge. There are two ways that a municipal judge can be removed. One is the expiration of his term. Two, he can be removed by the commission, which has been established for doing so. And that was the reference that you had up before that, uh, which is the, uh, Commission on the Retirement, Removal, and Discipline of Judges. Uh, part of this is in compliance with Rule 37, which is requiring uh, impartial, or no exertion of power over the municipal court at that point by council or the executive positions within the city. So in order for a judge for the municipal court to be removed, expiration of the term, or removed by the commission, obviously with a two-year term, that expiration of term, the council could make the determination not to renew that term, but they couldn't force him out prior to the expiration of that time frame without going through the commission. Okay. Uh, Filling of vacancies, this is controlled by statutory provisions, uh, 479.020 subparagraph 1, which allows you all the ability to fill the va filling vacancies with the advice and consent of three-fourths of the council. Um, and that refers back to the main authority that is granted to all cities to create municipal courts. Compensation for each municipal judge shall be determined by ordinance and shall not be dependent on any way upon the number of cases tried, the number of guilty verdicts reached, or the amount of fines imposed or collected. That is a critical provision for maintaining compliance with our minimum operating standards under Rule 37. We don't want the council to be able to exert control over the judge's compensation in order to increase the fines or uh, increase the imposition of right. sentences on individuals. That is also referenced directly under 130.050 of the code, and it's a very similar language. Uh, municipal judge shall receive such compensation as may be determined from time to time by the city council. 
The last one I've got is court administration. And here, I would tell you you have what I would consider greater discretion with regard to discussion of potential changes. Uh, I would note there are a couple of sentences in here. Uh, all personnel of the municipal court, for example, shall be subject to the administrative policies and procedures of the city, except as otherwise provided by law. And again, that takes into account our Rule 37 provisions. Um, Section 130.280 of our current ordinances has references with regard to the administration of the court by the court administrator. Uh, and as you go through this individually, I will be happy to point out provisions within that paragraph that might be specifically related to that. Um, and then the final document you've got in there is the surety bonds. Uh, that is required, uh, referenced in Rule 37 compliance, but also part of the best practice recommendations from Missouri Municipal Courts. <coughs> That would conclude my staff report. Again, I am happy to answer questions, but that's my quickest overview for you. As you can see, substantially, a, a substantial portion of this article is covered by both ordinance as well as statutory provisions. Okay, so um, does anybody have any questions of staff? We will go back to the beginning and go through points for our own discussion, but as to what Mr. Zerp presented, does anybody have any questions? Okay, seeing none. Let's go back to 7.1 regarding jurisdiction. Uh, I, the, the, there was a little bit of an intent for the demonstrative staff presentation to really kind of set the tone on this section. This is one of the rare instances from a municipal level that really we showed that so much of this is really actually controlled out of Jefferson City to the degree that we really don't have a lot of room. Now, there are some things specifically under 7.2 and 7.3 that we do, but I just, w we wanted to make sure we were aware that a lot of this is actually addressed up the line, and we like to keep our language in our charter broad, that way if Jefferson City starts, you know, mixing and matching, that we just kind of, whatever it is, our, our belt adjusts to fit, mm -hmm. and so, um, under 7-1 jurisdiction, does anybody have any issues or concerns with that section? Seeing none, 7-2 um, on the judges, I'd like to make a statement on the actual introductory sentence um, that might get a little confusing because it says the municipal court shall consist of one or more municipal judges. And while we actually specifically hired Judge Nigro, to be the judge, why would we ever have an instance for needing more than one judge? Well, and this is really also by operation of law, it is actually more common than thought that a judge will have a conflict of interest adjudicating over someone. Um, Missouri, I mean, Raymore is a fairly large community in Cass County, we are for 20%. Now, in Judge Nigro's case, because he comes primarily up from Kansas City, and practices all over the metro, he's not as likely to have had Raymore clients, but when we had Judge Olson, for example, who was a Raymore, Raymore lawyer, practiced here. Ms. Hubach, I think you're about the only one at the table that probably would know that, you know, go yeah, back I that would, long. I, I would think um, of him. He's, he's, Mr. Olson's been around a very long time and very well established in the community. He very regularly has had instances where a previous client had to come before him, and a conflict of interest requires that he cannot be a judge on that case. So, to, I mean, obviously the defendant needs, needs due process, and typically what happens is internally they create a special, pro, a special judge or a judge who comes in mm -hmm. for the sole purpose of hearing that one particular instance. I deal with this a lot. Uh, um, I'll give you an outside example. Um, it, judge Curry sits on the Belton Municipal Court docket. He has the same similar problems. And a couple weeks ago I was there, an attorney from Raymore who is a judge in another jurisdiction, Clayton Jones, he was on the bench. And that was because Judge Curry had a conflict. Judge Jones basically stepped in, heard the one case, and stepped back off and then Judge Curry took over the rest. So, but that counts as more than one municipal judge. So that's really what that means, so. Would, would we ever have a, a judge, a department of, for lawyers, <coughs> no, like we some have? 
because we're not, we'll never be that big, I don't think. But uh, they have a legal department. Well, and remember, when we did talk about the prosecutor section, there was a, the city has the ability to have one or more prosecutors. So we actually do have, we've already kind of discussed, there are instances where Mr. Marshall may have a conflict of interest. And so we've had special prosecutors come in. And yes, our code similarly would allow them the ability to hire more. And as we grow, I mean, this city... I'd even argue less than 10 years ago, it was Mr. Willerth and Mr. Marshall. And now, as our city attorney, we hire the firm because we have the opportunity to have a number of people in that firm. Mr. Zur is, of course, kind of designated as the primary, but Mr. Willerth is still available for city service, Mr. Kapke, et cetera, and, and other members of that firm. And because the complexities have grown to the degree that, and I, I mean this with all due respect, uh, we can put a pretty serious demand on Mr. Zur, and there may be instances he needs assistance, and Mr. Marshall at some point may grow to that as well. So, yes, Mr. I might also say that it, you may not have to grow a whole lot to have multiple dockets within the city as well. Uh, and if multiple dockets are required, uh, there are new jurisdictions or municipalities around this area that have multiple dockets and then multiple judges who will come in. So Independence, for example, has two judges that would be there. Lee Summit has mm -hmm. two or three. No, I think two. Two, two as well. And they can sometimes carry different dockets. So uh, I know in Kansas City, for example, they would have had a docket specifically set up for property maintenance code issues and a separate one set up for municipal traffic citations. So it's not a stretch to think that that might not someday happen. Absolutely. Um, anybody have any questions on the idea of having the ability to have a second judge? Okay. Uh, moving to Section A under 7.2, Ms. Hubach, you brought up the issue about the appointment for a term of two years. What, what is your thought on that specifically? <coughs> Well, it seems to me like when you're talking about law, you're talking about people that have ex special expertise. And it seems to me that two years isn't really long enough. Although there's other positions that are uh, considered two years. Was it two years is all that it takes for a term on the, uh, in the legislature? For a state representative, yes. Okay. So maybe that's not unusual then. But it just seems like three to four years, or maybe even five years, might not be out of line. I didn't know. Since I have no knowledge, really, of the law, I'm just trying to figure out common sense on some of this. Well, I, and I'll chime in on that. Um, this is one of the few sections where there's not the same rationale as for other term limits. For example, we've talked about city council members and the idea of the voters being able to change their voice. Uh, we've talked about city managers. We removed the indefinite term, but yet we want some tenure there, so we had some difficulty getting them on or off. In this particular instance, there's nothing so expressly unique about being a judge that requires a quick reevaluation. And the judge is really, they're the trier of law, so that really is, depending on how philosophical you are in your legal philosophy, you're not really bending at the whim of societal needs at that point. Um, they're supposed to be true to the law, and the law is kind of an elephant. It works very slow. And so in this particular instance, there is no foundation for what would be the optimal time period. It's kind of really what we want to do. And do we want to change our judge quickly? Um, I will say that we have been deemed kind of the minor leagues of the circuit court. It seems like our last four have moved up. Um, and Judge Nigro actually said to us when interviewed that he has actually is not seeking a position down in the county. <laughs> so I think we're going to keep him a little while, and we like him so far. But, uh, but for a while there, there was the intent where, I mean, Judge Olson, politely put, I remember him overseeing one of my speeding tickets when I was 16 years old. Uh, I won't tell you how many decades that was ago, but um, so he was here forever. He Rumley had, had a significant term Ooh, as Wagner. well as Wagner. 
And uh, while Lent may have been relatively quick, that was not because of a lack of commitment. It just an opportunity opened up for her to go to. But um, now, Mr. Zur, I know you want to do something. I have two points on that one. The first is um, the city attorney position is also a two-year term. So you guys, as a council, would have the ability to review the city attorney's position. I believe the other special council positions, they don't have specific references with regard to their terms. I would also note that uh, statutory provisions under 479, each municipal judge shall be selected for a term of not less than two years as provided for by charter or ordinance. So it would seem to me that you kind of correlated some of that over to here. Um, it would make it easy for you to have that come up for consideration by the council since the only other two ways that you can remove a judge are uh, through the removal process through the, comp through the commission or at the expiration of their term. So it's harder to remove a judge at the end of the day, so it gives you some reason for why a shorter time frame might want to be there for review. Well, you know, planning and zoning, they deliberately, the state deliberately picked it so that a term was not a coexistent with the city council because they said they didn't want it to be political. They wanted to be the citizens to do it, and so that's why they made it that way. And I was thinking maybe that's the same way with the law. We would not want our attorneys or our prosecutors or anyone like that to be chosen at the whim of a city council. We never know what's down the road. And I'm just trying to think ahead to what the next 20 years is going to bring us. I don't know. Well, obviously state statute says not less than two years. So they want it because they don't want a rotating bench. Um, and there's some, val I would argue at least the, the substantive value of once a judge hits a bench, they kind of become seasoned. They learn, they get better over time. Um, but it, obviously the pendulum can swing too far and they can stay too long on a bench. Um, it's, kind of, it's kind of what I guess I would say, is this something that you guys feel we need to discuss to consider? Ms. Schubach, were you merely bringing that up for discussion? Yes, or? I have no preference one way or the other. I'm just bringing it up, like you said, okay. for discussion. Um, my fear is uh, I could probably come up with lots of good reasons to keep it at two as well as go longer. And I'm not sure which one would prevail. Would you want it to be the same as the mayor, three-year term? Again, they're, they're what, what, and it's not challenging you. I, I like the question, but I'm not sure I could correlate a rationale. What would a judge and the mayor have to do with each other? Well, the mayor appoints the judge. Well, but we remember we approve it though the council does. With so the advice and consent, six, seven, and that's no. two. That's every two years. So actually, <coughs> the actual decision makers are the two-year terms. I don't know. Anybody have any any thoughts? We have, we have nothing to refer back to in any case. Either. This, this is a unique one. <coughs> obviously, kind of foundational reason to give a year. Just kind of how you feel. How long has it been? Two years, forever. Well, going back to state statute, I don't know when that w went into effect, but I, I, I have never heard of it being under two years since the late '80s. So. We want it to be under two years, but uh -uh. I mean, if if we've gone from a few to twenty thousand and kept it at two years, um, I think. I think depending on what we're looking at as far as population over the course of the next 10 years, that might be an incentive to change, but I, it's also worked that way uh, for all these years. So I'm, I'm kind, of, kind of with you. It's kind of one of those hairball things that we may want to come back to and after we get through this, but I don't see an urgency right now. Right on. Mr. Wigan. Is there any historical info as far as consecutive terms? Um, more often than not, if people move on to something else, <coughs> we have we had somebody that's been three, four consecutive terms? We don't, right? Because it, it, you're appointed to a tutor, but it doesn't say that we don't say anything about that term limits only right. being exactly. right. Yeah. I, so you I, know, because like this, I think back to the mayor discussion. You know, if you make it big and make it a five year, somebody that's a pretty good judge, that's a young judge who's willing to you know put in the time and, and be dedicated might not be willing to bite the bullet on a five-year or a four-year term that might seem long because they are wanting to go to the county. 
but we would still benefit from them. So I, I, I don't know. I, I was just curious. You know, do, have we had somewhere we've done back to back, or is it always every two years we get a new one? No. I, I go back 28 years with judges, and I can tell you, in the municipalities here in the metro and in Kansas where I've practiced, I don't think there's actually an identifiable trend. I mean, I will I mean, tell you that judges <coughs> typically, when they get on the bench, they stay for a while. Yeah. There, there's the desire, the stability, and the regularity of it. Now, we have seen ins I've seen instances where, because of just the weird openings, since, since especially at the circuit court level and above, there is an election process in Missouri, but typically there's not a lot of turnover. And so when seats open up, it's kind of you take it as you get it. So we've had instances where we've gone almost a decade without any changes of any level of judge, and all of a sudden in a year or two we get three or four moving <coughs> just because of a couple of openings. I just I think that his, that then proves that there's no reason to really add to the two because if historically people serve consecutive terms, then we don't have to worry about you know ditching and running constantly. Mm -hmm. So that's just my opinion. Yes, sir, Mr. Capson. In terms of more than one judge, historically, do we normally assign them two, say two, simultaneously, or they overlap, so they're not moving all at the same pace, in departure or advancement? The the replacement judge or the special judge, <coughs> there are rules governed under there are judicial rules, so they're also governed under the state, and there's a process that kicks in at that point. So the council does not pick the replacement judge. <coughs> if there's a special judge or a special appointment, that's typically handled through the judge or through the circuit clerk or the circuit court. Is that presiding judge? Yeah. Yes, sir. To the two-year terms of the municipal judge and the prosecutor, are they the same two two years? Do they overlap? We typically replace simultaneously at the same time. Same time. So we have a total change of the municipal court every two years, we could. potentially. You could potentially. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, I, I'm kind of sensing that we're not really looking for anything there. Um, a, a number in here we don't need to discuss, but I, it stands out. Under 7.2C, I know that sometimes people do look at the, you have to be an attorney for at least three years. Um, I can tell you that uh, different states handle it differently. I had a former student of mine who ironically was a college student of mine when she was 14, kind of a doogie hauser of the law. Mm -hmm. and, uh, she went off to law school in Virginia and she graduated, her, her intent was, I shall be in the bar before I can go to a bar. Uh, so that which was kind of cute. And she did, she became an attorney at age 21. And because of a shortage of municipal judges in the state of Virginia, especially out at the Appalachian portion on the far west side, mm -hmm. and some of those little rural towns, mm -hmm. she became a circuit judge at age 22 years old <laughs> with less than 12 months of law practice. Mm -hmm. Very weirdly, that has occurred. Missouri doesn't quite. Ha I don't. I think we got rid of our last non-lawyer justice of the peace in the mid '80s, so we haven't really had that issue. Sounds like a chapter out of John. <coughs> yes, and so now I will tell you that municipal practice is one of the easiest practices for an area of law for lawyers. Um, now I will tell you, you got to know a little of what you're doing. But young lawyers can adapt fairly quickly to municipal issues than they can versus some of the more complex. So if you've been practicing at, a muni at the municipal level for three years, you're quite aware of what a municipal judge goes through and what they have to deal with. Obviously, all our judges go through state training, so you don't just get a robe and go to town. I mean, there are specific judicial rules and training they have to follow. But three years into practice, you're pretty good. So while I, I bring that up, though, if somebody did want to ask a question about that or talk about that, but I, I, I am not the, the expert on this, but I will tell you, I feel pretty comfortable with three years. I don't think that has to be a primary issue, unless all the rest of you do. 
If not, I know that under D, under prohibition, that kind of corresponds with other areas of our charter as well that we've talked about with the you have to wait it, sit out a year rule. Yes. Um, so that's consistent with every other position. And that's statutory as well, too, for a conflict of interest. The vacancies and forfeiture of office and removal, the, th the next three, I would point out that I would almost discourage us from trying to impose if you notice, the city council can't just choose to get rid of the judge. It's not so clear. But if, if, you, if you ever sit through a very exhilarating uh, lecture by Mr. Zur on the Rule 30, Missouri Rule 37, uh, which was quite extensive, you'll realize that the state wants to really pull the judge away from guidance by the, by the council as a direct authority. And if we were to impose ourselves in this, I think there almost could become a challenge to argue that we are circumventing Rule 37. So and if you guys don't have any objection, I'd almost suggest we not make additional a, a, a ability for the council to interfere, since the courts are meant to be separated. Well, is there any of this in that we can delete because we shouldn't be concerned about it. Well, these three things, the general removal is just a, they can be removed by operation of law. Um, we want that. Um, they have the ability to unilaterally forfeit based on their own conduct, and then vacancy dealing with death, resignation, and removal is kind of a term of art. So I, I, I think we're good to kind of stick to that. Well, I remember when we were discussing Rule 37, I think it came up about five is a judge cannot handle more than five uh, cities. Yeah, uh, there was a limitation that mm -hmm. the state imposed on that. And you'd be surprised how many, law how many people that affected, more than I, I could ever imagine. Um, okay, filling of vacancies. Um, we have our criteria to get them in of three quarters, and the criteria for filling is three quarters. So I think that's actually consistent, so it would be strange for us to deviate there. Compensation, um, I, I think that's, does anybody have any concern over our ability to unilaterally contract with the judge? It's pretty open. Um, they can't take a change in compensation until the new term. Let me ask you this, what yeah. happens to the money that the judge is, uh, imposes? Because if they can't handle it, then uh, city council can't handle that money because that came in from the judiciary side. So who gets it if there's a profit or if there's a loss? I'm just curious. Well, 7.3 covers the administration of that. Mr. Zer, do you want to go through kind of the specific? Once it is received by that department, they internally handle their financial affairs but ultimately the, the, any net revenue would be given to the general fund. And is there, who decides when there's enough to give away to the general fund? There is very little discretion that the municipal court has based, <laughs> upon, based upon rules established by the Missouri Supreme Court. So for example, uh, we have recently received, we've tabled from a council's perspective, uh, sheriff's fund, uh, and I don't know if you would remember that, uh, it was about four weeks ago at this point, we tabled a matter that was related to the Sheriff's Fund. Uh, the Sheriff's Fund is a state statute that uh, would require that municipal courts receive $3 for every citation or every fine that's imposed. And what would end up happening is the court administrator ends up sending that $3 down to the state court's administrator in Jeff City, in Jeff City, and then they disperse it to the Sheriff's Funds. If you look, there is a schedule of charges. So in our city, we are limited to $225 right now that we can charge for fines and court costs and the additional charges. So every new charge that it gets applied by statute takes a little bit more away from what we are collecting on fines because we <coughs> cap that at 225 The sheriff's fund is one. Uh, we have the... Um, State home, a homeless shelter fund that is also provided for, and if you'd like, we can provide you with that schedule of all of those fees and where those monies go. 
but it leaves very little at the end of the day for dumping into the city's general funds. I, I said that little, very little is probably an overstatement. Um, but there are a whole lot of them that just pick off bits and pieces of those 200, that $225. Okay, I was curious because how does the, uh, the clerk get paid and did they ever get an increase in salaries? And if they need extra help, how do they, you know, who pays for it? If, if we can't tell them how much they can find anything, then we don't have any, really any authority to tell them how they spend it. I believe that's still all controlled by the city's budget at the end of the day. And what we don't want to have is we don't want to have the fines being used to pay for how the court operates. That's one of those other concerns that you'd have there because it would give the incentive for the court to continue fining as many times and as often as they possibly could. Uh, so there's still budgetary controls that the city has. Um, but as far as the fines and the court costs are concerned, a lot of those get picked apart by state level. Uh, one real quick one. DUI costs are one that may not be included in that. So for example, the cost for the police department to process a DUI, hey, it costs us X number of dollars to do this, and then we take the, the samples down to whatever lab or whatever it might be, those can all be charged as costs to it if that's the case. All right, um, 7.3 court administration, this is the last of, the, this is pretty discretionary, but if you'll notice, that um, the second, sen second sentence really kind of picks up. The judge does the annual performance evaluation of the court administrator along with the city council or the city manager. Um, so that's a unique oversight that the judge oversees with the court administrator, and it's not the council. And again, that delineates that separation. Um, then you'll notice again, all personnel of the municipal court shall be subject to the administrative policies and procedures of the city, except as otherwise provided by law, which again brings in a lot of these changes. And the, the last deals with uh, basically uh, surety that the personnel have since they're handling money. So I, I don't think these are really controversial issues. Again, I don't want to steal away anybody's review or desire to talk about it. But this is pretty boilerplate, and again, the demonstration is the, the higher courts are kind of laying down the law as far as the new rules, mm -hmm. and we just have a few small things we can talk about. Um, I don't think we have any notable changes in this section. Does anybody have any suggestions or topics to discuss regarding Article 7? My only thought was that anything, any of this duplicates something, then we can just eliminate it in front of our charter because that way we would not have to keep reminding ourselves we've got to change the charter, we've got to do this, that, and everything. If we can refer to the state law by reference, then that we wouldn't do that. But I think we've covered that pretty yeah. closely. Yeah. All right, moving on to under new business, we'll move on to Article 8 boards, commissions, and committees. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Stopped at Article Seven for our new business on that one for discussion purposes. Yeah, and I know that, but I know that verbally, you're going to have to tell me on the rules on this because we had verbally stated it in the meeting yeah. that our intention was to move on to eight. Um, then maybe nine. That's correct. I don't know if it's in the minutes. Mm -hmm. And the only other thing I would ask that is. Violation, sunshine violation to discuss it. No, you're not. For notice purposes, the notice purposes I don't believe have been provided for individuals who might want to come in as public members to yeah. discuss the Article 8. I'm sorry. Okay, fair enough. Well, then that eliminates our new business. <laughs> Moving on to status updates. Um, Obviously, no new changes tonight, so we have 19 to date. 6B, we will now be, after our next meeting, which is on April 4th, 
Now, if that is an election night, um, there are different schools of thought here. The planning, when I was on planning and zoning, we actually did occasionally meet on election night because we had a particular business that was important enough. The election ended at seven. We met somewhere else or met all, like in this room uh, to take care of small business. Since we don't meet in there anyway, would anybody have an objection to just, we, we're down to seven meetings and we have roughly seven sections. So while I think we're picking up a little pace here, I would like to be sensitive of that fact and encourage that maybe uh, please vote before you come. <laughs> or if you're in Ward 2, vote and then come out that door. Uh, but does anybody have any objection to going ahead, especially since we're losing out on going over 8 and 9 tonight, um, that we go ahead and meet on April 4th? Mr. Stidham? Yeah, I would rather not. Not meet? Not meet. Okay. Um, I tell you what, how about this? Let's do this by motion one way or the other. So um, I'll entertain a motion as to what we do on April 4th. Well, I don't remember that we meet. It, would, it was slated to be a standard meeting. It is slated to be a standard meeting. But we also, in the very beginning, acknowledged that there could be conflicts and that we can be flexible. One of the con things to consider is we want to get through this all, all this charter. So we've been pretty good about only meeting every other Tuesday. Would somebody have be in opposition of if we don't meet on the 4th, we meet on the subsequent Tuesday, which would then put us back to back. I unfortunately have to put next week, so I selfishly can get us out. If we meet, I, I, will, I will be at the meeting if we meet on the 4th. It's just frustrating when we have to leave here because we didn't get our wishes put into the minutes or the agenda. And <clears throat> we talked about it verbally at our last meeting and I would like, I, just, I feel like we're cut off and now we're being forced to meet on the election day, so. I would need to go and do things when the election's over. Um, and I was planning on standing there all day um, in front of the city, city hall all day. So I don't know that I would be attendance in attendance in this meeting because I wouldn't have had a break. Unless okay. I gave myself one, but well, well then I can withdraw my motion. If we just had longer meetings, maybe that would be the answer. Yeah. Well, the the fourth and the eighteenth of the two scheduled yeah, April meetings. Days. Would anybody, since we did not have a second to the motion, would anybody have an objection if we met on the eleventh and the eighteenth? And done two back to back. I'll make a motion that we meet on the eleventh, then in lieu of the fourth. Second. Any discussion? Um, Mr. Wiggins? Well, I don't know if that pertains necessarily to the motion, but um, you know, do, do we need to explore, and maybe it does pertain because it would happen to be on the 11th, but should we start anticipating, you know, maybe giving ourselves till 8 o'clock or later? I mean, I, I'm, I, based on the, the speed that we've gone, um, <coughs> Little, I'm a little disappointed in our progress, quite honestly. And so, I, do we need to anticipate two-hour meetings? And would that does that imply? Does that add to your motion that we meet on the 11th and the 18th? And can people commit to six to eight? Kind of thing? I mean, I, I guess I don't know if that's well. I, we're we're right now. <coughs> this one, one moment. We're right now at a point where we're basically going to fall roughly an article of meeting to get to June 7th. But that urge six, but that actually is not what we want our objective to be because we still want to have at least a meeting or two to go back, re explore a topic, okay. cull through the 19 if we want to shrink that number at all. So, to be honest with you, I would love to be done with all these articles in about two to three meetings and then allow ourselves two to three of a cushion. Um, we've done, and Mr. Wiggins, I, I understand and I, I don't dispute the frustration of time, but I do commend this body as a general whole because I know that previous charter commissions had to have like 
every week for right. months. I mean, it was jammed at the beginning. So I think we've had, We I agree, I would have liked to have been quicker, but I'm not going to insult the flow because I thought no, we I just pretty well. And I'm not saying you are sure compliant about that. Do we, does it need to be a portion of the discussion for the motion to consider extending the length of time of our meetings in order to not have to, I mean, I, I'd rather meet a half hour longer the next couple of times and get this done so that when we come back in and have three or four discussion meetings, if we need to, you know, there. Yeah. And I agree, if, yeah. if we're getting to the time of the year now that, you know, um, if we had to stay even till 8.30 or 9 and, and really jam something through, I would not have. To. I'd rather have empty sessions at the end than yeah. extra sessions. Well, we did discuss this in the very beginning. I don't think it requires a judge through motion because we actually already set that condition up front okay. because we did make the reference that we wanted to make sure quality over quantity. We've had instances where we've gone past 7.30 at times. Mm -hmm. so, not many. I just, um, not many. But I just didn't know if that was needed to be added or an element of the discussion for the motion. But and I would, I would love to, to have that attained. Uh, but just for the sake of establishing our next meeting, we have a motion and a second. Ms. Warner, you have a point. I apologize. That's okay, Mr. Chairman, if I may, looking at the room calendars, this room is booked on Tuesday, April the 11th at 6 p.m. <laughs> ah, who trumps us? Park Board. Park. The Arts Commission is meeting in the council room. <laughs> um, how long is the park board meeting? Depends on their agenda items and discussion. Fair enough. Fair enough. It could be a while. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Um, that was especially well, after the, the election. The weather's nice out there. It's not ice or snow. Why don't we just keep right on going? We can go ahead and stop, start talking about aid. Well, uh, I'm back technically, item the, section eight. I'm talking Ms. about. Ms. Hubach, right. one of the frustrations acknowledged is that this agenda is a public identification of what we are doing. Even though the door is open, anybody's free to come in, um, there may be a sunshine violation if we actually address substantively an issue. And so actually, I, I am compelled by Robert's rules to stop us. And I would love, I mean, I think there could be procedural discussions by saying, hey, we'd like a staff report, little things like that, but we can't talk merits tonight. And, and that's where the frustration comes from. Okay, so if we're kind of boxed out of rooms on the 11th, um, it's either we go back to the 4th and we do it on election night, although it looks like there is some, some you know, small conflict for across the board, or do we go ahead and just pass it off to the 18th? But obviously, since we're losing that extra meeting as well, it would precipitate running longer. By, I mean, it just kind of we're kind of getting to that point. If the building was available, can we use the uh, center view building? It will well, not be done until uh, toward the end of May. I could offer some other dates with rooms that the commission would. Would, uh, uh, why don't you get, how about this, why don't you some, <coughs> kind of throw some out and we'll see how the room feels. However, not a normal night on Wednesday night, the 12th, or even the 5th, following the 4th, um, this room is available. It is a Wednesday night. Thursday nights are court, of course. Right. Um, the following week, on the 12th, this room is available on a Wednesday. You want me to go farther than that? No. What about, uh, well, first of all, does anybody have any immediate, I, I know that when we were picking times and dates, yeah. there were some conflicts. Does anybody have an inherent problem with when, Wednesdays? Um, you cannot, okay. At the end of the month, I do, but if those two particular dates are, I have no conflict. The fifth, I have eighth grade enrollment. Starting the 19th, I will have 20 weeks of stuff on Wednesday nights. Okay, so we're Sorry. kind of, I think we've kind of created uh, two narrow options. We either go ahead and meet on the 4th and make do, 
We yeah. could possibly go later instead of six o'clock, um, and maybe go seven or seven thirty. It is dark or lighter out. That would help a little bit of that. Um, or do we go ahead and just call it and meet on the eighteenth? I'm good either way. I would be good on the twelfth if other people were. Well, we have a we have a known conflict on the twelfth and the fifth. I thought she said the twelfth was open. The fifth and the twelfth. This room is open. They're Wednesday nights, however. Well, the, uh, okay. Ms. Darren, are, are you sure? Are you sure, go ahead. Um, how do you feel about? How, how do people feel about the fifth? Oh no, you said you had I can't the enrollment. The fifth, so the twelfth. Anybody? I mean, so we lose one member on the twelfth. Well, how many members do we lose if we have it at the regular time? If we have it, if we have it on the fourth election night, we're likely down two. No, right? I'll, be two. Here. I'll be here. I'll be here. I'll just. I'll, I'll be here. I don't have to do what I'm. Uh, Would it and, help moving to seven? And this okay. and at this point um, in our process here, it's more important to be here. Is there? A, is there timing? Would like it help if we moved it to seven? It would help if we moved it to five. Okay. Well, and, and Mr. Burke, I can my, I can kind of slightly assume some of your conflict um, that. Uh, okay. but Go get my signs and. Well, here, yeah. here, here, because I, I mean, let's just. Hey, we got a little bit of time here. I'll, I'll just be open and casual about this. It sounds like we're potentially losing a member on the 4th or a member on the 12th. So we're going to be one down. So either way, which is the lesser of two evils? Do both. Ouch. We could lose one. No, I mean, it's, we, it's, we one, one on it's, one it's on eight members in one or eight members in the other. Yes. Um, which, which is the least... Effective or well, but it I, honestly it had nothing against the twelfth. But it, it sounds like <coughs> excuse me, I have to sneeze. It sounds like we have one full issue on the fourth, and one it would be nice to not come on the fourth. So we kind of have a one and a half, almost two, because I mean, sure, out of respect for Tim, I mean, I could he has something fourth, that he would like to do. Okay, so really, right the twelfth would be the lesser yeah conflict. You know, Tim doesn't want to. Tim doesn't want to admit it, but he he's got something he wants to do on the fourth. So real, I mean, nobody. And so I'm out of respect for that, out of respect for his schedule. agenda, right? Yeah. Um, so I'm no, I'm just saying out of respect for right. his comment earlier about that not being a good night. I, don't, I can't feel like he has to miss well, whatever he's going to miss. Can I be? Can I legally be this close to the election at six o'clock? As long as I'm not talking With the door about. Closed, you can. Okay. As long as not closed. campaigning. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, he's not going to be campaigning. Mm -hmm. okay. Just don't wear a campaign shirt. Right. Oh, that's true. I don't have any. <laughs> Fair enough. You latex. I won't make it. Yeah, you latex. Um, okay, so then then I we're back to a, my initial question. Do we do the 12th and lose Miss Daring, well, or do we just call the 12th on the 18th? We lose two. No, no, no. He was only a, no, was on was the 5th. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. I thought you had me wrong. No, 12th is okay. Right. Okay. So but if we go the 12th, I mean, is really okay we lose well. one, I mean, really. or do we just, I mean, because I, I also see the value in having all nine members, too. Um, do we just do the 18th and everybody expect to spend a couple, yeah, spend yeah, extra time? Absolutely. We just, instead of cutting it at 7.30, we cut it at 8. Or 8.30. Or whatever. I mean, yeah. Yeah. But, I mean and I've and, always and said, do that for let's finish a topic. Let's not start. Down. We're not working by the clock. But, well, wait a minute. Um, I'm a little confused here. <laughs> Why can't we keep on meeting here at 730 or whatever it is? When we have council meetings, we don't say that we're going to meet from 7 to 8. Sometimes it went, one of our meetings went to 11 o'clock. Right. So people didn't expect us to stop at a certain time. So no, we're, we're just saying on the we need to personally anticipate on the 18th yes. that we might, that we have our evening schedules cleared so we can sit here for three hours if we need to. Can That's what we're saying. It's not a public issue. Pad our agenda each time so we have the option 
to go if we over have the ability to, to, to table we, it for the say, next hey, time. should we keep pressing forward? And if it's if it's noticed properly, yeah. then we would be. And we have, and and, and, and I don't want to good? belabor this issue because it's it doesn't serve any point. But in previous agendas, you'll notice there's always been a, a, an right. identifier of subsequent articles. Right. This was an incidental a, oversight, yeah. and it wasn't anybody's fault, and it's no big deal. But um, obviously, everybody in the room now knows that won't ever happen again. So <laughs> just it's not just put deal. all of them on the calendar <laughs> from here on out. <laughs> yeah, just mark them off fine. as we go. And we just we, we've been very. We've been very good following the rules, and we're going to do that all the way. Right, right, right. So um, it's all good. But uh, so we'll just meet on the 18th. We're fine. Do we need to do we need to rescind the motion on for? It never had a second. It, the no, 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 the no, no, other no, 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 with respect. I will rescind the motion I made. Do you rescind sec the second? Okay. With so, respect to staff, though, we need to make sure that we don't put too much on staff's plate. On, on a potential agenda, but we should always maybe pad one extra. Um, well, so eight, nine, and, how about this? Eight, nine, and ten. Yes, sir. Um, we'll go on, because I, I mean, it eight, would be record short, breaking right. to do three of them. Right, well, but right. eight and nine are. I agree. Yes. Well, and ten. I mean, I I mean we're picking up pace here, but if we got three done in a night, we're going to finish in two or three meetings. Right. So we'll be good. Well, eight, but I, eight, I just want to give them half time of it to is research. Eight or eight is editorial notes or cross. Yes, we're not the we're not the only thing on their plate. I want to make sure we yeah. don't overburden staff. Yep. So I think we're fine. Um, yes. So that's good on that, and so we have solved that. The any other business? Okay, Bart. Motion to cancel the meeting on the fourth. Yeah, actually, that is administratively a smart move. So um, I will make a motion to cancel the meeting on April 4th. Second. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Right. Passes unanimously. Perfect. Um, the public, no public, so no comments. Um, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. We are adjourned. Or actually, sorry. Second. All, second, all in favor? All right. We're now we're adjourned. Thanks, guys. <laughs>